Welcome to CS uh, 2050. Um, the topic of today is functions. Everyone should know uh, what a function is because in some sense function is the most primitive useful atomic structure in all of mathematics. You've always, you've used functions, you've derived, integrated, polynomials are functions, everything is a function. Um, functions are themselves functions. But what is a function uh, really, uh, if, if not a relation, and what is a relation if not a set? So we're going to describe uh, more generally what a function is in a more general, like <coughs> this is not a, every class you've ever taken in some sense is about a kind of function, but this is a lecture about the functions themselves. Like, in the sense, not the properties of a function, but the property of being a function. So it's a, it, may be, it may be a little different. Um, first off, a relation, R, is a subset of the Cartesian product of two sets, A, B. And we write like uh, A, R, B if uh, the pair A, comma B is an element of R. This is a general definition of what a relation is. For example, consider the relation of less than or equals defined over the real numbers, right? This is actually a relation. Uh, and we define this as the set of pairs, uh, x comma y, elements of the Cartesian product of the reals, such that uh, x is less than or equal to y. Right. Um, this is sort of a cumbersome way to write a relation, but it turns out all relations are just subsets. right? In some sense, same thing with a function. Uh, a function, uh, f, is a subset of a times b. When we write it this way, this is not the way you've ever seen a function written as a subset of a Cartesian product, but it's implicitly in the background sort of what's going on. Rather, you, write, you, would, you would write the, the function like this. You'd say f takes elements of a to b. We'll define what those are. It's domain and codomain in a second, uh, such that if the pair a comma b is an element of f, you would instead you would write uh, Uh, f of a is equal to b. The element a is mapped to the element b. Now, every function is a relation by definition because it's a subset of a Cartesian product this way, but not all relations are functions. In fact, a function has a property that relations in general don't have. Do you guys remember what this property is? Do you ever given something that looks like a function and your teacher told you that's not actually a function, that's a relation? Do you remember what property those had to not be a function? Sorry, one more time? Inequality. Inequality of what? Vertical line test. The vertical line test, exactly. The vertical line test. Now, in general, in discrete math, uh, you can't always plot all functions. And like when you plot functions, you do subsets, you you are implicitly a and b are r and r. Discrete math, a could be an, a set of three elements, b could be a set of six elements. I mean, what's the, you can't exactly plot that nicely. So what instead we say, which is equivalent of the vertical line test, that uh, if f of a is equal to b and f of a is equal to c, then this implies that uh, b is equal to c. Now, when you draw a function, you may have seen it drawn like this. That's, a, that's essentially the vertical line test, right? A is a value of the x-coordinate in some sense, and then there's two distinct values, b and c. If those two distinct values exist, then it fails the vertical line test. So if there do exist two distinct values, b and c, they're actually not distinct. They're just two names for the same object. Um, you may have seen a function written like this, right? Something like that. This is a function, right? Implicitly, when a function is not a relation, is when it, if you see this picture, it looks like this. This is, for example, we'd call that A. This is B and C. This is not a function. 
So think of a, if, it, if it has something that looks like that, it's not a function. A single value in, maps to two distinct values. That's not a function, right? So uh, it, it, although a function can be defined as a subset of a Cartesian product, no one actually thinks of it this way. They think of it as an input and an output. You take something and you map it to something. That's what a function is, right? In, in, uh, very generally. Um, so uh, we have some properties of functions. We have, uh, if f is a function from a to b, we say a is the domain, b is the codomain, and then uh, the image or the range, the image uh, of f is the set of values in the codomain which are mapped to. So if you have an image like this, If f, uh, this is a, this is b, your codomain, you go to uh, some subset of b, but maybe you don't map exactly in, to everything in b, right? Sometimes a function will be defined with a specific domain and codomain, but then the image of the function is not actually, uh, uh, does not map to every element of the codomain, right? Consider the function f from the reals to the reals of f of x is equal to x squared, right? Uh, what is the domain of this? The reals. The reals. What is the codomain? Positive reals. No. This is a great, great exercise. The image, what is the image of the function? Positive reals. Yes. Positive reals and zero. Right? Zero is mapped to zero squared is zero. Positive reals don't contain zero, right? Uh, Non-negative reals contain zero. What is the codomain of the function? The reals, right? Now, every function whose codomain is not equal to its image, you could change the definition of the function with, to use a different codomain. You could say, well, here it's the reason it's the reals and not the positive reals is simply because I wrote r to r. I didn't write r to r plus or something like this, right? So the image will always be a subset, though, of the codomain, right? It's a, it's, sometimes it's equal to, sometimes it's not. Any questions on that so far? So a function is modern, is relatively modern in mathematics. Like, we know uh, what a triangle is and things like this, but we didn't really know what a good definition of a function was until, like, the 1700s. Um, and th the modern definition of function allows you to do some really kooky things. So consider the following function. Uh, f of, uh, is defined, let's say, from the reals to the reals, such that it's piecewise, such that f of x is going to be equal to 1. 1 if x is rational, and 0 if x is irrational, which I can write as... Uh, uh, the reals, but not the rationals, right? So this is an interesting function. Uh, I don't think it has a name. It's a, it returns a value of 1 if x is rational and a 0 if x is irrational across the real line. Mm, this is kind of weird, though. I mean, there's lots of problems with this. But it's technically a function. Why? It's defined as a subset of r times r. It's definitely a function. Um, but... I, I mean, I, I, you can't really do anything with it. You can't, like, integrate over it. What's the area under the curve of this function? Can you plot this function? Mm, don't really know. It's not really interesting. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, inter it's a very chaotic and, and very interesting. If you, any picture you could attempt to plug into a computer to try to plot this is going to be wrong. Because between every two rational numbers, there exists another irrational number. But also not every irrational number is a form of like square root 2 or something. There's most numbers in some sense are irrational. So it's a very ugly looking function. Uh, if you were to try to look at a picture of it, it doesn't look nice and curvy. There's no continuity. Every point in some sense is a discontinuity. So it's kind of not an interesting function. Yet we can modify it to be interesting. What is this function? Uh, consider 
Consider the same function, but we, we'll, we'll take g of x to be 2 f of x minus 1, the absolute value of 2 f of x minus 1. What is that function? That, I claim, is an interesting function. I mean, a nice function. f is not a nice function, but I claim g is a nice function. What is the absolute value of 2 f of x minus 1? It's just 1, yeah. So although I can't really plot f, I can actually plot g. OK, that's g. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Um, so functions have all kinds of weird properties, and not just the nice ones from calculus. I mean, you know log, you know n squared, you know all these other functions uh, that uh, uh, x to the n. All these all there's many interesting functions, but there's but the definition of a function is much more general than that, and allows all kinds of weird, insane things to define. You know, I don't think you could plot f, uh, for example. Questions on 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 that? Okay. Uh, what is the definition of equality? We say f is equal to g. Uh, well, we say, I'll say this way. Let f be a function from a to b, uh, g be a function from a to b. We say f is equal to g. The function f is equal to the function g when what happens? When should two functions be equal? G of A. For what A? Uh, whatever the domain is. Yeah. So we'll say for all A in A that uh, F of A is equal to G of A. This is a little different of an equality than the equality of sets or equality of uh, numbers or anything like this, but not really. Two functions are equal not if they have the same domain <laughs> or they have the same codomain, not if they have the same image. None of those require a function to be equal. Two functions are equal if and only if they have, they map the same elements to the same elements. f will take a to b, g will take uh, a, that same a to that same b. That's, that's, that's exactly when two functions are equal, right? Uh, maybe a little obvious of a definition, but also uh, worth stating out loud in this class, right? Questions on that so far? Let's define another operation of composition of functions. Uh, composition. Uh, if uh, f takes a to b and g takes a b to c, we say uh, f of g of x is a function that takes a to c. We try to define the compositions of the functions as uh, taking uh, g of f of is a, is a function that takes uh, a to c, right? Pictorially, you can think of it this way. Is f is some function. Let's say it does this. Right? f is some function. Uh, it's mapping a to b. Uh, g is some other function that will map uh, b to c. Then f of g is itself a function that maps the domain of f to the codomain of g, right? f of x will is, takes as input x as an a and will return a value b. g takes as input a value from b and will return a value c. So that you can compose that that way, right? That's defined as composition of functions. Probably seen this before, but worth looking at the picture. You can think you can go from a f to g uh, by going through b, right? If we were to draw this function out, what would it look like? Let's try. The first element would go to the first element. The second element would go to the fourth element. The third element would go to the second element. And the fourth element would go to the third element. Right. So those are the composition of those functions. Those are equal. Questions on composition? Perhaps we've seen it before. Right. 
All right, let's talk about uh, bijectivity or bijections. A bijection is a function that is injective and surjective. But what does that even mean? A function f is injective if uh, a does not equal b implies f of a does not equal f of b. As a picture, an, in an injective function is one that looks like this. Man, every marker can't be bad. Right. That's what an injective function may look like. It need not map to every element of the codomain, but in some sense, it injects itself. Uh, this is, this is a, an injective function, and this is an example of a non-injective function. Right? A does not equal B, yet F of A equals F of B. This is an example of non-injective, right? So you can think of injective function as one that is injecting. You may have also heard this called one-to-one. -one. Right? A function is one-to-one -one if A does not equal B implies F of A does not equal F of B. What is the contrapositive of that statement? Recall that a statement is, an implication is equivalent to its contrapositive. What is the contrapositive of that statement? Um, F of A equals F of B implies A equals B. Yeah. Should know that for the exam as well. Contrapositives, inverses, converses. Make sure you know that. Um, now this, the reason we want the contrapositive of when, when a function is injective is because that's easier to prove. Assuming A does not equal F of B, implies f of a does not equal f of b may be slightly more difficult to prove depending upon the function itself. But assuming that f of a equals f of b and then you deduce that a equals b is not, turns out in practice is pretty easy to show. That's what it means for a function to be injective. Uh, a function is surjective if for all, uh, let's say, b in the codomain b, there exists an A in the uh, domain A such that uh, uh, F of A is equal to B. No element of the codomain is forgotten, right? Now, there's another characterization of when a function is surjective, right? This is an example of a function which is, we would say, surjective. This is a surjective function. This is a non-surjective function, right? When is a function uh, surjective? What's another characterization of when a function is surjective? In terms of things we've only t talked about in the Yeah, exactly. A function is surjective. A function is surjective. There's no dot here on the right-hand side. That's just sort of the easy way to think about it. This dot is some element b, which is not mapped to by an element of the domain, right? This is when a function is, um, if this exists, it's not surjective. This, all the elements of the codomain are mapped to by some element of the domain. So this is a surjective function. This is not a surjective function. So a function is surjective if the domain, uh, if the codomain is equal to the image. That's when a function is surjective as well. Right. Um, now, uh, not every function is surjective. Not every function is uh, injective. Uh, let's give an example of a function that is uh, uh, both. A function is said to be bijective if it's surjective and injective. Surjective and injective. Both of those must be true for it to be a bijection. When you think of a bijection, you should think of this photo. It is surjective because every element of the codomain has been mapped to. It is injective because a does not equal a equals um, f of a equaling f of b here implies that a equals b here, right? f of a does not equal f of b here implies, excuse me, a does not equal b in the domain implies f of a does not equal f of b 
in the codomain, right? This is the picture of a bijection. In some sense, this is a perfect pairing of the two sets. A bijection is a really strong function. We, a lot of times, we want only bijections. We need bijections for things. So uh, uh, the other functions are sometimes disastrous, a little useless. The bijections are the ones that we care about. So that's why we care about proving injectivity and surjectivity. Um, what is a function that is uh, injective but not surjective? Uh, let's say it looks like this. Right. That's injective but not surjective. By the way, the other name for surjectivity is onto. Right. Uh, sometimes you may see a one-to-one -one function being called, excuse me, an injective function being called one-to-one -one and a surjective function being called onto. You say a function is onto if, same definition. These mean the same thing. Sometimes you'll see surjectivity uh, as onto and you'll see biject injectivity, excuse me, as one-to-one. Bijectivity is both still, right? You've probably, have you guys seen the word onto and one-to-one -one in some other class? Have you guys seen injectivity and surjectivity in some other class? So you, you guys are more familiar with one-to-one, on, -one, onto? Okay, then I'll use the surjective and injective to make it more, uh, um, to make it harder. Um, the way I remember injectivity is it's like injecting. It's going in a straight, it's like a needle. The other ones are not injective. So let's give an example of a surjective function which is not injective. Um, That's surjective. Actually, we'll do this. Write it this way. Surjective, but not injective. Um, and then finally, which is what is a kind of function that may be neither? Let's do that. Something like that. Neither. So bijections are the nice functions. Surjections, injections are the ones that we need bijections. There's two quick properties I won't prove, but I'll mention uh, of bijections. And one is the fact that uh, the inverse of a bijection is a bijection. Well, I'll prove that, but it's obvious what it is. And the inverse of a function is the one that maps b to a, right? You flip it around. Um, we're not going to get too deep into that, uh, but you should probably know what an inverse of a function is. Um, notice that the inverse of a non-surjective, excuse me, a, a non-injective function, the inverse of a non-injective function is actually not even a function, right? Recall a non-function looks like this. This is a relation, not a function. But this is the inverse of a non-injective function, right? Um, here's a second reason. Um, if f is a function that maps a to b and is a bijective, then the cardinality of a is equal to the cardinality of b. Again, a and b, you may think of it as infinite sets for the reals, and you may think, of course, those have the same size. But of course, in discrete math, we're giving a more general definition of function, and we're writing a and b instead of r and r, because this isn't calculus, and a and b sometimes, oftenly, will be finite sets, a set of size 3 and a set of size 4 or something. you know. Uh, but a and b have the same cardinality, the same number of elements, if and only if there's a bijection between them. This is, in fact, an if and only if. right? If two sets have the same cardinality, then there is a bijection between them. That, we won't use those properties, but that's like hinting towards why we want bijections. They're nice. They're great. Questions so far on these definitions? We'll, we'll prove some functions that may be, to be uh, bijective. You guys have seen bijections before from other class? Um, this, notationally, we define the set Zn to be 
uh, 0 through n minus 1. That's what the notation z subscript n is. If you've ever seen that, it means a, it's a finite set of the naturals. Although we use z instead of n, it's uh, a subset of the naturals uh, from 0 to n minus 1. Consider the function uh, f of n. Uh, f is from uh, z4 to z4 such that uh, th uh, f of n is equal to 3n plus 1 mod 4. Let's start simple with a finite set and try and prove this function to be a bijection. It turns out this is a bijection. So z4 and z4 have the same size. Obviously they do. I mean they're the same set. But we can prove that this is a bijection between uh, these two sets. So uh, first we, we prove f is a bijection. By proving it is injective and surjective. For injectivity, uh, what we're going to do is first uh, uh, let uh, f of a be equal to f of b. Recall the proof of function is surjective. You use the contrapositive definition. f of a equals f of b implies a equals b. So we assume f of a equals f of b for two distinct a and b. And then we will conclude that a is equal to b. So let f of a equals f of b. Uh, so uh, we get 3a plus 1 is congruent to 3b plus 1 mod 4. And we'll talk a little bit more about modular arithmetic later. But this is kind of like an equivalent. This is an equivalence that's kind of like an equal sign. That just means equal if you take the mod. So you take the mod, and then these are equal, right? For example, uh, 8 is congruent to 4 on uh, mod 4. Both of those are congruent to 0. You guys know what a mod is, the remainder? You know, you do the, parent the parentheses, the percent sign in a computer, right? We write it this way. Um, if 3a plus 1 is congruent to 3b plus 1 mod 4, then we know that 3a is congruent to 3b mod 4. By rules of modular arithmetic, we can subtract one from both sides. Uh, and then, for reasons we don't yet know, 3, you can eliminate the 3 here because 3 and 4 are what are called relatively prime. But that, what we can say here is that implies that a is equal to b mod 4. And since a and b are elements of z4, they're between 0 and 3 anyway, right? So we see that f of a equals f of b implies a equals b, right? Questions on this one? You start with f of a equals f of b, you conclude a equals b. Right. Now, surjectivity is actually, in practice, I think, harder to prove. Um, what you can do for a finite function like this is just draw a picture and observe that every element of the codomain has been mapped to. It's sort of a forced brute force method, but it works. Let's try it. Um, what element maps to 0? We want to show that every element of the codomain has been mapped to by an element of the domain. So in fact, what we'll do is instead compute the function forward and then talk about its inverse. Zero, when you plug zero into f of n, what do you get? One. Zero goes to one. When you plug one into f of n, what do you get? Zero. Zero, yeah. When you plug two into f of n, what do you get? When you plug 3 into f of n, what do you get? 2. So obviously, actually, you can just tell by the picture that's obviously a bijection. Okay? The elements on the codomain are just in a different order. And recall, a set need not necessarily be ordered. Suppose I wrote that on the other side in a different way. It would obviously be the picture of the bijection that we have of the straight horizontal lines. Um, here's how we would argue that this is a surjection. 
uh, each element of the codomain has been mapped to by some element of the domain. 0 is mapped to 2 by 1. 1 is mapped to 2 by 0. 2 is mapped to 2 by 3. And 3 is mapped to 2 by 4. Since for every element of the codomain, uh, we are mapped to by some element of the domain, the function is therefore surjective. Um, this is such a simple finite function that it, it, proving this to be uh, bijective was actually quite easy. But we'll do a harder example for, for when perhaps the domain and codomain are not uh, finite. Yes? So does the parentheses with the function like mod 4, does that determine the codomain? Uh, the codomain is determined by the definition of the function here to be z4. We say it's z4. Recall we had f of x equals x squared, but the codomain was hard-coded to be all reals, even though the image was non-negative reals, right? So the function defined will be the codomain. Because often you don't know what the, what the image of the function is until you like, compute it. The, do domain, the domain and codomain are like given as part of the function. The image of the function requires computing the function, which may not be easy to determine. Like, it, does, a, does a function have a number that's negative in it? For complicated functions, you can imagine that's hard to determine. So the image is so, somewhat a separate question than that. The, the mod 4 notation here, when we put a parentheses mod 4, we mean that the input, when we write it this way, the input is 0 through 3, and the output is 0 through 3. And it is convenient for us that mod 4 is one of those outputs. Now, suppose we did mod 5 or mod 10. If we did mod 5 or mod 10, it's possible that this function will return like 7 or something. But in fact, by definition of this being 0 through 3, we would simply not even write those. We would ignore any values that come between 4 and 10, or 4 and 9, or something like this. Even if the mod takes it out, we just wouldn't define that. <coughs> a function is said to be total if all elements of the domain are mapped. Now, a function is not surjective if there's some element of the codomain that has not been mapped to. But by definition, all the functions will talk about and care about are called total functions. So every element of the domain must be mapped to something in the codomain. You'll never see, at least in this class, you'll never see something like this. Yeah, something like that. Right? You'll never have some element of the domain unmapped to. This is what we would call a partial function. And we don't really care. We only care about total functions. Every element of the domain is mapped to something. Perhaps they're all mapped to the same element, right? Consider like f of n is equal to 0 for all n. That would be like this. Right. Questions on this proof of surjectivity of bijectivity of injectivity? We've proven that it's bijective by showing that it's injective and showing that it's surjective. Let's do a little more complicated one. Consider the function defined from the reals except 2 to the reals except 3. And it's defined this way simply so we don't divide by 0. Of f of x is equal to 3x over x minus 2. Right? I've removed 2 from the domain and 3 from the codomain simply so we won't divide by 0 in, in any way that this function is defined. And suppose you want to prove that this function is a bijection. We prove f is a bijection. Um, uh, so we first prove it's injective. Uh, let uh, f of a is equal to f of b. Then. We want, to conclude, we want to assume f of a equals f of b and then conclude a equals b. This is how every injection, uh, injectivity proof works. So we'll s if f of a equals f of b, we simply write the equation with a and b in it. So we get 3a over a minus 2 is equal to 3b over b minus 2. Right? But then that gets us what? 3a b minus 2 is equal to 3b 
uh, a minus 2. Again, no problems simply because we know a and b cannot be 2 because we removed it from the domain. We're not dividing or multiplying by 0. Right? Um, 3ab minus 6a is, equivalent, is equal to 3ba minus 6b. Okay, No mistakes there, right? You guys are double checking my work. Make sure I'm not missing a minus sign or something. Well, if we minus 3a from both sides, 3ab from both sides, we're going to get minus 6a is equal to minus 6b. And then from there, we can divide both sides by negative 6 to get a equals b. Great. So the function is injective. Now, when you write that out as a proof, you would also write down everything I'm saying out loud. You would not simply just show the work. A tra tra train of thought must be explained. Um, so all the things I'm saying out loud sh should also be written down, right? So this is an example of how to show injectivity of a function. And great part about this proof, uh, at least for the injective part, is if you were to draw the picture of it to look like this, the, pic the, the domain and codomain are both infinite. So you would never finish drawing a photo like this. And it's not obvious that it is injective, as in it's missing this thing uh, from its picture, a little fork like that, little pointy piece. But by proving it's injective, you could say something about the infinite nature of the function. So I think that's kind of cool. You can just assume f of a equals f of b and conclude that, well, a must be equal to b. So it is certainly uh, injective. Now, we want to prove uh, f is surjective. Uh, now, for infinite functions like this, I'll tell you that proving surjectivity is harder. You have to do every proof three times before you turn it in. You have to do just scratch work to figure out if it's even true or not. Then you do you sort of outline the proof a second time, and then finally you turn in a pure certified document. You know, it's got to be the you only should turn in things that are good, right? So how do you prove for every element in the in the if just open-ended discussion, how would you prove for every element in the codomain that some element maps to it in the from the domain? What's a strategy you may employ for that? Not a proof technique, but what would be like, for example, the first thing you may try? So you want to show that a generic element of the codomain has been mapped to by some element uh, of the domain. So for all b in the codomain, you must show that there exists an a in the domain that maps to that. And what, the, what that basically involves is inverting the function, like letting f of x equal to y, and then you get the function in terms of y, right? So what we say is uh, let r be an element of the codomain. Now, you want to show that there exists some value x that maps to r. Uh, consider x is equal to 2r over r minus 3. Now, how did I get that? I literally inverted the function. I set, I set f of x is equal to r. I set this equal to r. And then I worked backwards to get x equals something. Right? Can't always do that because you're dividing by zero. Not every function is nice and analytic that you can move things around and get that. So this would, is something that I am writing on the board, but you are not witnessing the scratch work I did in order to get this. Right? This is just the proof. I say consider x is equal to 2r over r minus 3. We prove that f of x is equal to r. This is sufficient to show, we'll show that in a second, but this is sufficient to show surjectivity because r is any element of the codomain and there exists an x in the domain. If we can show this, we're done, right? So f, excuse me, x is then, of course, a function of whatever r was chosen to be. If r was 2 or something, then, of course, x is some specific number. Um, let's prove that by plugging it in. Now, this is going to be a little tedious, but let's go through it anyway. Just for fun, I'm not going to erase the definitions of those uh, for now. I'll just do it on the bottom. We want to conclude that f of x is equal to r, right? So consider, consider yourself with uh, f of x, which is equal to f of uh, 2r over r minus 3, which is equal to 2r 
r minus 3 times 3 over 2r, r minus 3 minus 2. And we want to prove that that is equal to r, right? I simply substituted it in 2r over r minus 3 for x in f of x is equal to 3x over x minus 2, right? Now, if I move stuff around, this is the part that's annoying. I'm go I, I claim I'm going to get 3 times uh, 2r over r minus 3 uh, times 1 over uh, 2r minus 2r plus 6 over r minus 3. I move some stuff around here. I'm going to bring this to the top. I'm going to get uh, 3 times 2r over r minus 3 uh, times r minus 3 times 2r uh, minus over, excuse me, 2r over minus 2r plus 6, which is going to be equal to uh, 3, 2r, and then 2r, 2r cancel. We're going to get over 6, right? Uh, what is uh, that that's simply equal to r? A little fast and loose in the scratch work there, but we found a value of x such that f of x is equal to r. Right? So therefore, the function is uh, bijection. We proved uh, since uh, f is surjective and injective, f is bijective. Questions on that? I want to give some remarks about the theorems we said about the usefulness of a bijection. A bijection, uh, the inverse of a bijection is also a bijection. So the inverse of this function is also a bijection. Uh, and also that the two sets have the same cardinality. Now, this actually, in a complicated way, will apply to infinite sets. But if you take the real numbers and you remove the number 2 from them, you get a weird looking set. If you take the real numbers and you remove the number 3 from them, you also get a weird looking set. But it turns out that those two weird looking sets have the same number of elements. So you've taken infinitely many numbers and you subtract one, it's the same. So that is, and we can prove that by saying there's a bijection between those two. Right? So this is a, bi uh, a bijection. Uh, questions on that? Yes? Can you explain what you're what defines surjective again? A surjective function, the easiest way is to think about this photo. A function is not surjective if there is an element of the codomain which doesn't have a value mapped to it. A function is surjective if its image is equal to its codomain. It's not surjective if it leaves something strang stranded in the codomain. Nothing maps to that specific value. Surjectivity is a little more annoying than injectivity. The way we write this is, is for all b in the codomain, there is an a in the domain such that f of a is equal to b. So there, for every element in the codomain, there exists some element in the domain such that the computing a f of a will map to that b for all uh, elements in the domain. Right. Um, you can think of a function, if you think of the, if the finite functions and you think of pictures, the right-hand side always has a dot. That's when it's not surjective. That's an element that's not mapped to. Um, there are certain functions that are, that are, are certainly uh, not surjective. We talked about f of x is equal to x squared will never be negative. Right? So the, that has infinitely many points that are not mapped to. No real number squared is a negative number. So therefore, uh, that is not a surjection. f of x equals x squared. Right? That's when a, fu a function is surjective if there's, uh, it, it covers the uh, codomain. More questions? Any questions in general on surjectivity, injectivity, bijectivity? Yes. So if you're looking at like x squared and you're trying to. x squared, what are your domain and codomain? Um, Reals? The, the, well, for the codomain, wouldn't it be? Or yeah, it would be reals. OK, so let's say reals to reals. Positive and negative to positive and negative. What's your question? So if you had, if you're trying to, you said let f of a equal f of b. So when, whenever you take like the square root of like both sides, 
Um, would it not just be x equals x, or would it be like or a equals b? Ah, is this function injective? It turns out this function is not injective. So a proof only shows something to be true. A proof cannot actually so, show something to be false. You can, this function f of x equals x squared is also, is not only not surjective, it's also not injective. Why? Here's a counterexample. 1 and negative 1 both map to 1, right? So it's not injective. Now you can't uh, show that a proof fails and therefore the negation is true. You must show a counterexample or something like this. And this is an example of a counterexample. But it's definitely true that a squared equals b squared, that does not imply that a equals b, as we've seen, 1 and negative 1. Great remark. x squared is not, uh, in, it's not only not surjective, it's not even injective, right? <coughs> questions, more questions on injectivity, bijectivity, surjectivity? Before we get to the, one more topic. All right, let's talk about monotonic functions real quick. A monotonic function is a function that's basically always growing. It always goes up and it never goes down. So for example, we s a function, for example, like x cubed is one that we would say is monotonically uh, increasing because it looks like this, right? Infor I'm going to give you the informal definition and then give you the real definition. Monotonically increasing is that you're either staying flat as you walk. Think of yourself walking along the graph. You're literally always going uphill or you're flat. You're never going downhill, even for a half a second. It's nowhere you're going downhill. Uh, the way we write this, we say f, and this is a function usually defined from reals to reals, is monotonic, monotonically increasing. And of course, you can define monotonically decreasing functions the same way. Uh, if a, uh, we'll say, excuse me, we'll, we'll say x is less than or equal to y implies that f of x is less than or equal to f of y. Right? So if x is greater than y, what that means is that x is here, y is here, that f of x is less than or equal to f of y, right? This is what it means for, a, that's the formal definition of what a function it means to be monotonic, monotonically increasing, but informally you can like look at it and say, yeah, that's definitely monotonic. Most nice functions are monotonic. If your function is not monotonic, something is weird has gone on, right? Um, a function is strictly monotonic, strictly, not just strictly monotonic, strictly monotonically Increasing. If it's not only monotonic, but then there's no there's no flat land, right? There's a slight inflection point here on x cubed, uh, but it's n technically monotonically increasing. Here's a uh, we would say it's strictly monotonically increasing is if x if uh, if x is strictly less than y implies that f of x is strictly less than f of y. X cubed is in fact uh, strictly monotonically increasing. But here's an example of one that's not strictly monotonically increasing, but it is monotonic. Right? Piecewise, something weird. That is not strictly monotonically increasing, but it is monotonically increasing. There is an area of flatness. You know, you, but you're definitely not ever going down. This is the formal definition of what a monotonically increasing, strictly monotonically increasing function is. Uh, let's prove... Uh, f of x is equal to x squared is strictly monotonically increasing. And we'll even further suppose that it's limited so we don't have to deal with any negative behavior. f of f uh, is only from positive reals to positive reals. So I'm going to change the domain and codomain instead of reals to reals to positive reals to positive reals just to make the proof a little easier. We get to use properties of positive numbers. Uh, before we do that proof and to demonstrate it, any questions on monotonic, the, the definition of a monotonic function? 
you may have, be, have known what a monotonic, fun a monotonic function is, and you maybe have never heard it called that. But you've looked at a function and be like, yeah, that's monotonic. So, um, here's how we'll prove this. Let uh, x be strictly less than y. And then we can do two things. Uh, then x squared is strictly less than uh, x times y. What we're going to do, if x is less than y, we'll multiply both sides by x, x being some positive number. Then we know that x times x is strictly less than x times y, if x is less than y, right? But also we know, if x is less than y, we also know that xy is less than y squared. We take the same inequality and we multiply both sides by y, right? So we know that x squared is less than xy, and also that xy is less than y squared. So we get that x squared is less than xy, strictly less than xy, which is also strictly less than y squared. What does that imply for us? x squared is less than y squared. Yeah. By transitivity, x squared is strictly less than y squared, which implies that f of x is strictly less than f of y. If x squared, f of x equals x squared, defined for the positive reals, recall it's a hyperbola, Excuse me, it's a parabolic. Uh, but if you consider the segment of it that's only positive real numbers, the, f the first quadrant, it's monotonic. Not only is it monotonic, it's strictly monotonic. Right. Questions on this? Yes? Like what if um, x or, or like y was a, like a decimal like between 0 and 1? Um, I claim that a decimal squared, that's right. Yeah, so I'm just going to change the proof to make it easier. I get to do that because I'm, I'm the teacher. So. Uh, questions on this? Okay, cool. Let's take our little 10-minute break.